Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. So in our previous lecture, we looked at the segregation era 1910 to 1948. This week, we will be looking at the apartheid era 1948 to 1955. So the National Party, in May, 9, in May 26, the National Party, it wins the general elections after its initial victory in 1948. So the National Party consolidated its power. In that year, it created new parliamentary seats for representatives of white voters in, South, in, in Southwest Africa, six in the House of Assembly and four in Senate, who were elected to support the government. So gradually, the apartheid regime systematically dismantled any forms of black representation within the central political system. So through a series of steps, the government ensured an exclusion of black individuals from political participation. So in 1956, after a long political and legal struggle, it dealt the colored votes in the Cape province, most of whom had supported the United Party, the same blow as Herzog government who dealt the African voters in 1936. So it placed them on a separate role and gave them the right to elect whites to represent them in parliament. So 14 years later, it abolished the parliamentary seats of the white representatives for both the Africans and the Colors. okay? So now for three decades, the National Party had the support of an overwhelming majority of Afrikaner people. And then in the elections of 1966, it also began to win substantial support from English speaking whites who were attracted by the government's determination to maintain control in the face of increasing black unrest and foreign criticism at the time. So it won successive elections by increasing the majorities, right? So the National Party, it used its control of government to fulfill Africana ethnic goals as well as white racial goals. So now in 1961, South Africa was granted total independence from Great Britain. And this, it achieved um, a major ethnic objective in 1961, when after obtaining a narrow majority in a referendum of the white electorate, the government transformed South Africa into a republic, thereby completing the process of disengaging from Great Britain. So the government had intended to follow the precedent whereby India remained a member of the British Commonwealth when it became a republic. So at a conference of Commonwealth countries, however, the African members supported by Canada as well as India, they sharply criticized apartheid. And South Africa then, it withdrew from um, that association. So the government, meanwhile, it Africanized every state institution. It appointed Africaners to as seniors as well as in, as in junior positions in the civil service, in the army, in the police, state corporations, and me, um, medical and legal professional associations too. And it came, every, everything just came increasingly under Africana control, right? So the government also assisted Africaners to close the gap between themselves and the English-speaking white South Africans. So now it directed official business to Afrikaner banks and allocated valuable state contracts to Afrikaners. So now Afrikaner business people channeled Afrikaner capital into ethnic banks. So investment, houses, insurance companies, and publishing houses. So by 1976, Afrikaner entrepreneurs had obtained a firm foothold in mining, manufacturing, commerce, and finance, all, all of this, um, which previously was exclusively preserved for the English speaking. So whereas in 1946, the average Afrikaner income had been 47%, that of an English-speaking white South African, in 1976, it had risen to 78% and it continued to rise um, after. So in 
So the political successes of the National Party were due to were due in part to the rising standard of living of white South Africans of all classes, with the exception of um, occasional recessions in the early 1960s and 1970s. So the South African economy experienced consistent growth, right? And the primary beneficiaries of this economic growth were the white population. So particularly white farmers who were Afrikaner, um, white farmers received substantial support from the government, leading to the mechanization of their farms and substantial increases um, in their output. So now the government, um, the government assisted them to obtain and keep black wage laborers and to eliminate black occupation of white land as sharecroppers or renters. Remember, we spoke about this earlier in one of the lectures. So you can see they extended the racial laws of segregation era and they tightened up the administration of these laws. So now, Ferwood's grand design of apartheid with blacks um, all living separate. So we can see that the term apartheid developed from a political slogan into a drastic systematic program of social engineering. So now, Ferwood was born in the Netherlands in 1901 and he migrated to South Africa in 1903 with his pro-Boer Dutch parents. He was brought up in Cape Town in Southern Rhodesia in the Orange Free State. He identified passionately with Afrikaners. In his private life, he was charming. In public affairs, um, he was dogmatic, intolerant, do domineering, and xenophobic. So after acquiring a doc doctorate in psychology, can you believe it, at Stellenbosch, the, which was the premier Afrikaner university, and spending 1927 visiting German universities, he became a professor of applied um, psychology at Stellenbosch. In the mid-1930s, he promoted the cause of the poor white and the post-Jewish immigration from Nazi Germany. So in 1936, he became the founding editor of Die Transvaler, created with nationalist funds for the express purpose of rallying Transvaal Afrikaners to the party. And then by 1948, um, he was widely known as a fiery Republican. Malan then made him an appointed senator and in 1950, Minister of Native Affairs. So he was, the, he was a prime minister of South Africa from 1958 until September 1966, um, when as he was about to take a major speech um, in Parliament, um, he was stabbed. So Fervut um, was stabbed to death by a man known as Dimitri Tras Fenders, who was the, a parliamentary messenger at the time. Tough Fenders was, a, was painted out as someone who was insane and deranged um, and as a result was found unfit to even stand trial, thus not guilty of Fervut's murder by reason of insanity. So, but his life has, it actually, um, if you ever look into Dimitri, he was, um, his life was, he actually has quite a rich history of political activism and it's quite an interest, it has quite an interesting life story. Um, here is a clip of Tafendis Dimitri in hospital. Because Dr. Hendrik Firwood was an immoral man, I decided to stab him and I killed him. So in 1999, Lisa Keys was allowed to conduct two televised interviews with him um, for a documentary that was called A Question of Madness. So she put forward that the suggestion that he may have been acting as part of a wider conspiracy. Dimitri, at the age of 81, he died of pneumonia in October 1999. So during Fervut's premiership, apartheid um, became the most notorious form of racial domination that the, that the post-war world has known.
So the process continued under Farwood's successor, Forster, who was the Prime Minister from 1966 to 1978. Because Dr. Henry... So at the heart of the apartheid system of four ideas. So the nationals, the National Party government um, applied apartheid in a plethora of laws um, and executive actions. So the first one was the population of, of South Africa comprised of four racial groups, the white, colored, Indian, and African, each with its own inherent culture. The second being whites as a civilized race, which enti were entitled to have absolute control over the state. The third one, white interests should prevail over black interests. The state was not obliged to provide equal facilities for the um, subordinate race, the fourth being um, the white racial group formed a single nation with Afrikaner and English speaking components, while Africans belong to several, eventually 10 distinct nations or potential nations, a formula that made the white nation the, the largest in the country. So when we look at um, when we look at the late 1940s into the 1950s, so soon, so soon after coming into power, so soon after coming into power in 1948 the government began to give effect to those ideas um, that I just spoke of. So there was the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act, 1949, the Population Registration Act of 1950, and this provided the machinery to designate the racial category of every person. So its application led to the breaking up of homes, um, for example, um, where one parent was classified white and the other was classified colored, there was the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act and the Immorality Act of 1950, which created legal bound boundaries between the races by making marriage and sexual relations illegal across um, the color line. So the Group Areas Act and the Bantu Homelands Act of 1951, it effectively divided all the races, different races were forced to live in their own reservations, and then those reservations were forced um, to become independent nations. The reservations became independent nations. So this means that blacks um, and other races needed passports to come into white territory, right? Into the towns, into the cities. So now, in 1952, the National Party passed the Abolition of Passes and Coordination of Documents Act, which forced um, black people to carry identification. So thousands of people were arrested um, because of bad passes. And this act, it led to a revolt where 69 black people were killed and 147 were injured. So in 1953, after a court had ruled that segregation was not lawful in public facilities for different racial groups were not equal, as in waiting rooms um, at railroad stations, Parliament passed the Reservation of Separate Amenities Act to legalize such inequality. So the government also transformed the administration of the African population and then in 1951, it abolished the only official countrywide um, African institution, the Native Representative Council. <laughs> 
So there's an image here I have um, for you to just look at. So as you can see in the image, the reserves were organized into eight later 10 territories. So each territory was te designated as a homeland for a potential African nation and placed under the administration of Bantu authorities, um, predominantly consisting of hereditary chiefs, right? So within their respective homelands, these African nations were meant to develop independently, enjoying the rights that were denied to them in the rest of the country. So the legislative framework envisioned by Fervut was finalized in 1971. So with the Bantu Homelands um, Constitution Act granting the government the power to confer independence on any homeland, so the government's propaganda likened this process to the contemporary decolonization of European empires in tropical Africa, as you can see on the map. So the Transkei served as a pioneer in this process, being granted so-called self-governing. So now status, is, this was in 1963, and achieved independence in 1976. So... So Baputa Swana followed in 1977, Venda in 1979, and the Siskai in 1981. So as these homelands attained so-called independence, their citizens were stripped of their South African um, citizenship. So they were living in South Africa, and they were stripped of South African citizenship. So the Pretoria government also ensured that, that collaborative chiefs such as Matanzima, the Matanzima brothers, brothers in the trans guy maintained control of the homelands. So KwaZulu Natal, the, the most populous homeland, um, represented a partial exception. So Chief Mango Suti Mango Suti Butelezi established a powerful political organization called Inkata, um, which refused to accept independence um, on the South African government's terms. And it developed an ambitious relationship with um, Pretoria. So despite significant economic um, growth in South Africa during the 1950s and the 1960s, the homelands remained economically disadvantaged and poor. And each homeland consisted of multiple land fragments, often separated by white-owned farms. So Bapo, Baputwana, for instance, comprised 19 scattered fragments, fragments, some located hundreds of miles apart. Fervut prohibited direct investment by white capitalists in the homeland, and um, the homeland governments relied on subsidies from Pretoria. So under the apartheid, under apartheid the conditions of the homelands, they actually continued to deteriorate um, they continue to deteriorate, failing to provide adequate sustenance for an increasing smaller proportion of the African population. Consequently, the economic incentives for Africans to leave the homelands, either as migrant laborers or permanently, grew stronger than before. So, so Africans were forced to, to leave their homelands um, as migrant laborers, right? So African individuals relied on wage labor um, in the major industrial complexes of the southern, trans, of southern Transvaal, um, Durban, Port Elizabeth, Cape Town, so furthermore, no foreign country recognized, by the way, the sovereignty of the so-called independent homeland. So apartheid included, included stringent and progressively sophisticated control over black South Africans. So the government, it aimed to re relocate 
nearly all Africans to the homelands, except those who were deemed um, essential as laborers um, by white employers. So in 1967, the Department of Bantu Administration and Development explicitly stated this policy in a general circular declaring that Bantu were only temporary residents in the European areas of the Republic as long as they provided labor. So once they were no longer fit to work or sur surplus to the labor market, um, they were expected to return um, to the country of their origin, the homelands, or the territory um, corresponding to their ethnic identity. So now if they were not born and raised in their homeland, if they were not born and raised in their homeland. So to enforce this policy um, in the urban areas, the government intensified the efforts of its predecessors to restrict um, the, in, in, the influx of rural areas. So this involved prohibiting um, visits to urban areas for more than 72 hours with a special permit and granting um, officials in the authority to arrest any Africans who failed to produce the required documents. So the past laws resulted in the annual arrest of like a hundred thousand Africans um, and it peaked. Um, over the years it went up really really high. Um, so the government also relocated African squatters from unauthorized um, camps near cities. Those who were employed were placed in segregated townships, while the rest were either sent to the homelands or to farms where their labor was required by white owners. So additionally, the government initiated the eradication of what they called black spots in rural areas referring to land owned or occupied by Africans within white um, regions. So as white farming increasingly became co co commercialized and mecha mechanized, Africans um, lost their remaining land rights on white farms, um, rendering many of them irrelevant to the labor needs of farmers. Um, so now what happens to these access Africans? They were expelled from the white rural areas um, due to restricted access to urban areas. Most were, were compelled to resettle in the, in the homelands, even if they had no prior connection to that homeland. Um, in certain instances, the government established new townships adjacent to existing urban centers and treated them as part of the homeland system. So for examples, um, this would include Tanzania in the Eastern Cape, um, which is near East London, and Umlazi in KwaZulu-Natal near Durban. So in other cases, displaced individuals um, were concentrated so densely in the homelands, far from existing urban centers, um, that new townships emerged. And we're gonna get into it in the later lecture, um, how these townships emerged and the conditions of these townships. Okay, so in the cities outside the homelands, the government um, relocated significant numbers of colored Indians and Africans from their previously occupied land to new segregate, segregated satellite townships. So through the implementation of the Group Areas Act um, in the 1950s and its subsequent amendments, the government divided urban areas into zones where only members of specific races were permitted to reside and work. So in numerous instances, areas previously inhabited by black individuals were designated for ex exclusively white occupation. So one of the most infamous removals under the policy was the case of Sophia Town, which was located four miles west of Johannesburg, of the Johannesburg Center. So Sophia Town had been one of the few townships where Africans um, 
owned land prior to the enactment of the Urban Areas Act of 1923, so which effectively prohibited African land purchases. So in 1955, the government forcibly relocated the African residents to Meadowlands, a location 12 miles away from the city. So Firetown was rezoned um, for white occupation and renamed don't know if it, I should pronounce this in an Afrikaner tone. Triumph, triumph, triumph. Okay, another well known removal took place in District 6, um, adjacent to the center of Cape Town, which had been a vibrant community predominantly inhabited by colored individuals since the early 19th century. So the homes in District 6 were demolished and the residents were relocated to the Sandy and wind swept Cape Flats. So in Durban, many Indians also faced severe displacement, losing their homes and businesses in areas um, designated for white um, occupation. So now, when we look at the expansion of brutality under the nationalist government, so one of the initial um, repressive legislations enacted by the nationalist government was the Suppression of Communism Act um, of 1950, so which broadly, which broadly defined communism and granted um, the Minister of Justice significant powers to take immediate action against individuals deemed to be supporting communist objectives. So the minister could ban a person and prevent him or her from joining spe specified organizations. Um, communicating with other banned um, person or publishing anything at all. Or he could confine the person to his or her home without the rights to receive visitors. So the minister did did not have to give reasons for his decision and victims had no legal means of challenging it. So the repressive legislation escalated from the mid 1950s and um, onwards. So the mass of legislation gave um, the police vast powers to arrest people without trial and hold them indefinitely in solitary confinement without revealing their identities and without giving them access to anyone except government officials. So the government could um, ban any organization, prohibit the holding of meetings of any sort and prevent organizations from, from receiving funds from abroad. There were also laws um, that gave the government special powers, um, also other laws that gave the government special powers over Africans. And then now we're going to look at um, resistance to apartheid. So soon after the elections of 1948, leaders of all white South African churches, um, except the Dutch Reformed churches, issued statements criticizing apartheid. Um, in the following years, many clergy came into conflict with the government. So the English medium universities, particularly the University of Cape Town and the University of Witzwatersrand, served as centers of resistance against apartheid. So apartheid also brought into being um, women's organizations. Um, you can see here in front of you, Women of the Black Sash, 19, Sash in 1955. So the white, mainly English speaking middle class members of the Black Sash devised a skillful method of embarrassing nationalist politicians and attracting media attention. You can see them here wearing white dresses with black sashes. They stood silently with heads bowed in place where politicians were due to pass, um, such as entrances, um, such as entrances to parliament buildings, and the government banned such demonstrations in 1976. But the Black Sash remained in existence, running offices that gave legal advice to Africans who had trouble um, with apartheid laws. 
Okay. Um, authors also played a significant role in exposing the detrimental impact um, of apartheid. So, um, Ellen Patton, pa Patton, Pat, I hope I'm saying it right. He was a renowned um, bestseller novelist of Cry, the Beloved Country. He published, um, which was published in 1947, he advocated for compassionate race relations and he continued to criticize apartheid um, in the 1950s and the 1960s. So in his writing, he expressed um, concern over the Group Areas Act and he stated that, I quote, God save us from all the South Africa. God save us all from the South Africa of the Group Areas Act, which knows no reason, no justice or mercy. So for many Africans, success involved adapting to apartheid by evading the laws. So living in the informal economy or acquiring a powerful patron or patron, a chief or a white person. So other Africans um, found um, a niche in the formal economy. Um, they became teachers, they became nurses or industrial workers. So they formed the nucleus of an African middle class and African working class. So shortly, um, after the uh, shortly after the National Party assumed power, a new generation of leaders emerged within the, um, within the ANC. So encouraged by the protests in Johannesburg during the war and the miners' strike of 1946, in 1949, during the annual conference, three members of the Youth League were elected to the National Executive. Um, Walter Sisulu, born in 1912, Oliver Tambo, born in 1917, Nelson Mandela, born in 1918. They all, all the three, all of, all of them, they hailed from the Transkei region and received their education in mission schools. So while both, um, while both Tambo and Mandela had been expelled from Forte University, they continued their study through correspondence courses at the University um, of South Africa, and they eventually qualified as, um, as lawyers. They even established a joint um, legal practice in Johannesburg. Um, among the group, Mandela emerged as um, the dominant um, influential figure in the group. So three years later, the conference elected um, Albert Lutuli as president general of the ANC. Um, he was born in 1898. And Lutuli, Lutuli bridged the old and the, the new elites in the party. So in 1952, the ANC and the South African Indian Congress, which had undergone a similar change of leadership, they launched a passive resistance campaign and attracted wide support. So large numbers of volunteers identified, large numbers of um, volunteers defied discriminatory laws and 8,000 were arrested. The ANC called off the campaign early in 1956, no, 1953. However, after rioting had broken out in Port Elizabeth, East London, Cape Town, and Johannesburg, Parliament had enacted severe penalties um, for civil disobedience. So now in 1955, the ANC formed a coalition representing a broad spectrum, spectrum of South African society to organize a campaign designed to enlist the participation of the black masses and win the sympathy of the outside world. So with the cooperation of the South African Indian Congress, the South African Colored People's Organization, 
the small predominantly white Congress of Democrats and the multiracial South African Congress of Trade Unions, the ANC convened a Congress of the People. So on June 26, 1955, there were 3,000 delegates, over 2,000 Africans, 320 Indians, 230 coloreds, and 112 whites met in an open space um, at Clifftown near Johannesburg and adopted um, a freedom charter before the crowd was broken up um, by the police. We'll get into into the Freedom Charter. And, um, okay, so the Freedom Charter, which would go on to serve as the fundamental policy statement of the ANC, was crafted by a small committee comprising members of Congress of Democrats, including individuals of different ra racial backgrounds. The drafting process involved the compilation of grievances from various individuals and committees across the country. The Freedom Charter read, South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and that no government can justify, claim, justly claim authority unless it is based on the will of the people. It then set out um, a list of basic rights and freedoms derived largely from ideas um, in, in, in then in um, ideas in, in, in liberal circles in Britain, um, continental Europe and the United States um, equality before the law, freedom of movement, assembly, religion, speech, the press, um, the right to vote, to work with equal pay for equal work, um, a 40-hour work week, minimum wage, annual leave, um, unemployment benefits, free medical care, um, equal education, so the Freedom Charter also included some socialist ideas. Um, and um, I'm gonna read you another quotation. So the mineral wealth beneath the soil, the banks, the monopoly, and monopoly industry shall be transferred to the ownership of the people as a whole and restriction of land ownership on a racial basis shall be ended and all the land redivided amongst those who work it. So how did the government respond to this? So the government responded by enacting further legislation and in December 1956 it arrested 156 people and charged them with high treason in the form um, of conspiracy to overthrow the state by violence and replace it with a state based on communism. So the court was not um, persuaded that any of the accused had planned to use violence. But the trial dragged on, preoccupying um, the leadership until March 1961, when the last 30 were found not guilty. It was a long trial. So, although the ANC and its allies in the Congress movement were all male dominated, was were, or an all male dominated organization. Um, women like Lillian Goyi and other women had formed the Federation of South African Women, which organized protests against the decision of the government to extend the past laws to African women. 
So the demonstrations culminated on August 9, 1956, when 20,000 African women assembled outside the union buildings, the um, National Administrative Headquarters in Pretoria, and they delivered a petition to the MT Prime Minister's office and stood in silence for 30 minutes. Two years later, the police arrested 2,000 African women for refusing to accept the passes. Nevertheless, the government stood by its decision and from 1961, African women were obliged by law to carry passes. Other protests, um, other protests were reactions against um, specific local events. African men and women in the townships around Johannesburg and Pretoria, for example, they boycotted the bus um, company for raising the fares and walked up to 20 miles a day to and from work between January and April 1957. Okay, so we are going to stop this lecture here. And we are going to continue next week with the SEC2 era, which um, also deals with many of the things we have spoken about in this lecture. And I am... Um, it will delve also more deeply in women's role. Um, okay, so thank you for listening and I hope you have a good week.